Hello and welcome to another virtual Secret Bits session. My name is Simon Whiteley and I want to talk about Spark. Now Spark is a really, really cool open source big data processing platform that can revolutionize everything that you're doing in terms of building analytics platforms. Be it data engineering, data science, even humble analysts can get a whole load of use out of Spark. However, for the past couple of years, it's been the de facto approach to jump on Databricks. Databricks is a company started by the guys who invented Spark, and they're pushing the boat forward in terms of what Spark can do. However, this year, we are going to see the release of Azure Synapse Analytics, which has its own inbuilt Spark engine. And that begs the question, if you want to do Spark, if you want to harness the power of lakes and all that kind of stuff in your analytics platform, which one should you be looking at? So in this session, we're going to have a look at Databricks versus Synapse Analytics, specifically the Spark engines, and just talk about, in theory, what they offer, what they don't offer, which one you should choose, where you can use them, and hopefully shed a bit of light on what the difference is. Now, this is all talking about the theory, all talking about the stuff. This isn't a technical demo session. So set expectations. We're not looking at code. We're just looking at what's under the hood and how it works. Let's have a look. Okay, so as I said, we are looking at the big beatdown that is Databricks versus Synapse Analytics. Again, my name is Simon Whiteley, and I run a company called Advancing Analytics in the UK, and we do a lot of data consultancy, anything from data engineering, how to build a lake, how to use Spark to make your lake amazing, through to data science and how to do custom vision and how to build recommenders and all of that kind of fun. So we have a booth, feel free to stop by and say hello. Any questions about this, I'm live in the session answering questions or pop by the booth later and we'll get you sorted out. Okay, right, onto the meat. Let's see what we're talking about. One, why Spark? Why am I even having this conversation with you? Why do we care about Spark? So, the age old approach is building a warehouse, having these three steps, going, I've got some staging data, some cleaning data, some warehousing data. That's old hat. But we've all done it. Most of us still do it. It's building a warehouse on a SQL server, usually it's a single SQL server, lots of databases, and some kind of ETL job, be it SSIS, be it Talon, be it just store procs, something doing some kind of transformation for us. And that's not great. So there's lots of bottlenecks in there. There's lots of things that slow us down. The code's not that flexible. Whole load of reasons why that's people are moving away from that wig, one box, SQL server, just using a relational database and going, you know what, lakes are pretty cool. Lakes give us a whole load of flexibility. They give us a whole load of uh, exotic file types, machine learning integration, scalability, loads and loads and loads of reasons why having a lake and having Spark on top of it is fantastic. So this is kind of what people are doing now. Some arguments as to whether you do it all in one box, whether you have a separate warehouse, that's a separate conversation. For now, if we have a lake, and we're doing some preliminary data prep, some work in the lake on those flat files to prepare them to show to some end users, to prepare them to put them into a data model, then the tool that we're using to do that lake-based data preparation is Spark. Hands down, that's kind of the winner these days, especially in Azure, we're using some kind of Spark-based platform. It's not saying that won't change in the next few years, currently Spark is one of the best things for doing that. So, What's actually this, what is this Spark thing? There's a few different layers and there's a few different things. And I want to give you a little bit of context as to how Spark has changed in the past few years. So you've got this thing, you've got the engine. It is a open source project, basically. There is a big old engine um, written largely in a combination of Scala and Java. And that'll come up later. Um, but this is kind of a load of data pro uh, processing libraries. A lot of things to help you do common tasks, grouping things, aggregating things, pulling data, data readers, data writers, all of that kind of stuff encapsulated in a data processing engine that very, very importantly is all based around doing things, one, in memory, and two, in parallel. So saying, I want to take 100 machines and spread my workload across it. I'll take two machines and spread my workload across it. Scale has the same code, and that is amazing. I can just write one little bit of code and then the same code can be used to scale across massive volumes or small volumes, it doesn't matter. So that can bring a load of flexibility, a load of good stuff in there. Now, the way it scales, so the way that we can actually say, take a data set, take one big chunky table of data essentially, but give that worker some, that worker some, and just take and spread it across all these different workers, 
happens because of this thing, the RDD, the Resilient Distributed Data Set. And that used to be where all of the magic happened. So all of the work you used to do in Spark was coding directly against these blocks of data and saying, take that block, iterate through it, give me a number, add it to that block. And it's fairly manual, but allowed you to do distributed queries, which is good. Um, these days, we have two abstractions on the top. So we've got to think of the data frame API, and we've got to think of the SQL API. Now, data frames just means that we can write Scala, we can write R, we can write um, Python, and it'll turn it all into the same code, which means we have language parity across different things that are going to end up running the same thing, which is amazing. So you can have people writing R, people writing Scala, people writing Python, no performance difference between it, and it all runs on the same engine, all on the same platform. So it's less of an argument of, oh, which one do we get for our users? It's a, no, you just, each user can choose. Not necessarily the wisest thing, but you have that flexibility. And then the SQL API is an absolute killer because so many people know SQL. Most people know a little bit of SQL if they're working at all, especially in the data world. Um, so that ability to query your lake via SQL is huge. That's a massive, massive thing. So few bits in Spark, which just mean it's really, really geared towards the kind of thing that we as data people do. So writing some data transformation scripts using Python, and then having users come in and query all those different data elements just using the SQL and using the same syntax, the ANSI standard syntax that they know and love, is awesome. So that's, that's why we're using Spark. Spark's really, really good for those elements. And the kind of things, just to set the scene a little bit, if I've got my lake, and I've just got a CSV sitting in my lake. Now, inside uh, Data Lake Store, inside any HDFS back storage, so that's a Hadoop distributed file system. So that's Blob Storage, it's Data Lake Store, it's Gen 1, Data Lake Store Gen 2, it's S3 buckets over in Amazon. Anywhere you are that has this HDFS idea. Essentially, if I've got a big file like a CSV, plock that down in my storage, and I'm going to take it and actually cut it up into lots of different readable chunks called extents. So even though I've just got one file, I can actually read from it in parallel by reading these different chunks and saying, actually, all my different workers in my Spark cluster, that worker can read that data, that one can read that data, that one can read that data, and suddenly parallelism happens, even on a single file. And then when you imagine you've got a folder with thousands of files, suddenly everything scales fantastically. So the kind of thing that we're going to see, we're going to say, hey, I've got a Spark job. I want you to go and aggregate this, give me the maximum for a certain column, whatever it happens to be. It's going to pass it to this driver. So I've got a little brain node at the top. I'm going to take that, tell each of the workers, hey, this is the work I want you to do, and you to do, and you to do, and you to do. And in this case, they're all being told which of those extents, which chunk of that file should they go and access. And they'll each independently, completely look at each other, go and do their own bit of work. They go and get the data, pull it onto the cluster, do some processing, return the results. We'll collect all the results onto one of our workers to then do another job and aggregate all the answers, go, what's the maximum of all my individual maximums? Return that to the driver and I've got my data. And everything that we're doing in Spark has a similar kind of pattern. It's always a tell the cluster to do something, it figures out how many steps it needs, how many of those workers it needs, how much it needs to chop up the data, um, and then how, we, how many steps to get it back to us. That's just Spark. Spark does that for us. We don't care. We don't have to tell it the uh, threads. We don't have to tell it which worker can get which bit of data. We just say, go and read some data, and it'll figure all that stuff out, which is awesome. And that's all the goodness that is in the Spark engine these days. And that's just all regular Spark. Nothing fancy there. That's not Databricks or signups. That's just how Spark works, the open source project. So having a look at our two options then. So we have the entrenched, the champion, the old boss, that is Databricks. And we've got the new challenger. We've got the Synapse Analytics Spark pools that are now presenting two managed options for working with Spark in Azure. Now, you might be sitting there going, um, it's kind of missing the other one because there is a thing called HD Insight. And HD Insight has been, you've been able to run Spark in Azure for years using HD Insight. Uh, however, it is fairly arduous to set up. There's a lot of conflict needed. There's a lot of setting up all the various nuts and bolts, and it's not that um, platform as a service. It still has lots of elements where you need to control. So I'm not looking at that in today's comparison. The comparison is the ones that are real turnkey, push a button, you've got a Spark cluster, you can start working. And that's these two. This is Synapse, Analytics, and Databricks. 
Okay, so let's learn a bit about competitors. Okay, so we've got Databricks. So the old champion released back in 2016 in uh, AWS. So it is cross-platform. And that, that's an important piece. If you build a, a ton of scripts out using Databricks, you, can, you do have the option to port that to Amazon in the future. So you have quite close parity in terms of the two versions that are working across them. Um, it has its own runtime. So the guys in Databricks, they contribute, I think something like 20, like 80%, I think. Either 70 or 80% of the content that goes into the Spark open source project comes from Databricks. It's the guys who invented Spark, started the company. That company has exploded in the last year and they are pumping so many changes into that Spark project. However, they don't pump everything into the open source project. So you have the open source, this is what Spark is, and then you have all the extra wrappers that Databricks add around the top of their own Spark engine to make it faster, to make it fancier, to give them a, a premium offering worth paying Databricks a license fee. Um, it's pretty cool. So there's a lot of workspace stuff, and we can talk about what's inside that Databricks workspace. And we'll talk about this thing called the Delta engine. Because Databricks are currently about to release a whole new version of everything that they do. And that makes this comparison really interesting. Because most of the comparisons that we've seen is people saying, well, this is current Databricks. This is what's going to be signups when it's released. And they're comparing that like for like. It was actually the same as we're about to see this brand new first release of Synapse Analytics Spark. We're about to see the same on the Databricks side for the Delta engine. And then it's going to be a completely different comparison. And I'll pull out what some of those features are as we go through. Okay, so that was Databricks on this side. We've got Synapse Analytics. So our, our spunky young contender coming in to try and knock Databricks off that champion spot. So one, it's still in preview. And we have to remember that going through. There's lots of things that still don't quite work. Lots of things that are still very beta release and we're going through seeing evolutions of it. Since I started looking into Synapse Spark, it's changed a hell of a lot as a load of new features have come in, they've gathered user feedback, they've changed how they're implementing it. So it's very much a work in progress. It's very easy to be fairly down on the Synapse Spark uh, implementation because it's not finished yet. You look at the two and go, well, I can't use that in production because it doesn't work yet. And that's because it's in preview. And so when we get to general reliability, we should see a slightly different beast. But we have what we have to compare for now. Uh, it is Azure only. However, it is very, very similar to the vanilla Spark runtime. So as the Databricks runtime has loads of extra tweaks and features and options and things you can enable, the Synapse Spark one has a lot of vanilla options, which means if you take that code, that same code should run on almost any other Spark instance, including Databricks, including ones you're running locally, including HD Insight. So it's kind of, because it's very, very vanilla, it means it is quite portable, even though the actual Spark instance itself is proprietary inside Microsoft. And yeah, it's, it's different. So we're so used to thinking about Spark in terms of these clusters, in terms of thinking what different cluster designs do I need, how big does that need to be? And they've taken a different stab at it. And we'll talk about that in, in a later section when we look at how we actually ramp it up and scale it. But yeah, it, it's, it's different, but interesting. Uh, and special skills, what, what are the good features? Why would we even think about this, given we've got Databricks there as a mature contender already? And integration is definitely going to be one of those interesting arguments. So because it's inside Synapse Analytics, this thing automatically talks to the other compute elements inside there. So the thing that used to be SQL Data Warehouse, SQL on Domain, which is really cool, things like Azure ML and all that kind of stuff, Cosmos DB. There's lots of Azure native integrations that are being built directly into the Spark pools, which is gonna, only going to grow and get bigger and bigger and bigger. So that's a super interesting area to go, okay, if, if all I'm interested in is integrations and how it works with the rest of the Azure architecture, there's a lot of really, really good points in here. The other one's Spark.net, so C Sharp for Spark. So in normal Spark, we can write, as I mentioned earlier, in Scala, in Java, in Python, in R, and in C. However, if we're in Synapse, we can also write in C-shell. So if you have a big .NET house and they need to integrate directly, they can just write C-shell against the Spark engine itself, against the data frame API. And that's really cool. That has a load of extra stuff built in there. If you've got a load of .NET libraries you'd love to be able to use to control your Spark packages, that can now be done straight away. So interesting stuff. 
Okay, so I mentioned there's some benefits to the Azure Databricks workspace. So the kind of things that we get in there, there's a whole user management suite, which is good, but it actually doesn't link into Active Directory groups, which is painful. But still, the ability to have users and onboard them and have security and say who can start clusters and who can't, that's all baked into this, this workspace. We've got Databricks notebooks. Now they're Jupyter based, but they're not quite Jupyter notebooks. They've got a load of extra things in there. So we can do things like charting and dashboards directly in there. We've got widgets for controlling dropdowns and having parameters. There's loads of really nice quality of life features inside the Databricks notebook experience. Uh, you've got jobs. So if I want to schedule it, it's kind of like SQL agent, it's kind of a dumb schedule in that you can just say, run this job with these um, parameters in this cadence, every hour, every day, whatever it happens to be. But the ability to have that scheduler and the ability to call that scheduler from things like REST APIs from Data Factory, that actually becomes really cool. So heavily, heavily parameterized uh, notebooks can be. We've got a whole library management system of pulling in things from uh, PyPy or Maven, Fran. So all the online repositories where people tend to keep all of their open source libraries, we can just connect in and pull it down and say, whenever I start my cluster, just connect and get the latest version. That's really cool. It means I can have a lot of my library management, my, my dependency and package management baked into the workspace itself. We have a thing called DBFS. So that is a file system that's baked into the workspace, which is okay, but has some issues. Uh, essentially, it's because it's storage and it's blocked off, you can only see it within Databricks. However, one of the things we can do is mount storage drives. So we can say, well, I've got my data lake store gen 2 lake with all my data in there. Just mount it treat, as it, treat that whole file system as if it was part of DBFS, that Databricks file system, and then you can go from there. So there's a load of cool stuff we can do, and loads of utilities for files. And finally, we've got a whole cluster management piece. And this is one of the things that's, it's a little bit weird when you first start using Spark, and, well, certainly when you first start using Databricks, because in so much of Azure, you've got this idea that you're provisioning a service and you have to pick how big it is. I want a database and I need to scale it how big that database should be. I'm going to provision, I don't know, functions, I need to say how big they are. Um, with Databricks, you provision the workspace, and that's not, there's nothing in there, really. Then inside the workspace, you can set provision lots of different types of cluster, and they're the things that cost you money when they're turned on. So it's like a whole little resource management portal all of its own. So a lot of really cool stuff in the Databricks workspace. Now, on the sign-up side, that is just a whole load of other things baked in. So whereas Databricks is very focused on being the Spark engine. So it's got lots of features to make Spark richer and to make you, allow you to interact with that engine better, but it is just Spark. Whereas in Synapse Analytics, as we can see on screen, we've got lots of different tools all kind of being baked in to this eventual thing. So we've got a bit of data factory. We've got some of the thing that used to be called Azure SQL Data Warehouse. As of this recording, it's currently called Azure Synapse Analytics but that's the current GA version, which is just the data warehouse. When we eventually have general availability for this new thing, the Azure Synapse workspaces, that's going to have that provision SQL pools. It's going to have what used to be SQL data warehouse baked inside it. It's going to have on-demand SQL server. So the ability to just write SQL with that database turned on, no, no ongoing compute, and it will charge you a terabyte red which is awesome, and you can write things against the data lake and just spin up a proper, fully-fledged SQL engine just for the single-serving lifetime of your query. You've got this Spark engine, and that's what it sits inside. It is very much part of this, and that's, again, coming new. And we've got Data Factory. So we've got a whole version. It's called really, orchestration pipelines or something within Synapse Workspaces, but you open it, and it's Data Factory. So rather than the Databricks, this is just Spark and some gubbins to make it nicer, we have this whole suite of different tools of which Spark is just one piece of that jigsaw. To look at it a different way, we've got kind of, this is my little signups estate uh, picture. So we've got at the top that data factory and mapping data flows is baked in. And again, mapping data flows is a Spark based GUI. So you can drag and drop and say, I want to pull data from there and there, combine it together, add some drive columns, do an aggregate, write it out to there. And then when you hit go on that, that runs a Spark job. That runs on Spark for you, which is really interesting. So that's kind of another option for doing, for exposing Spark to users, but who don't have to be Python, Scala, or R savvy. 
So that's a nice bit at the top. The bottom we mentioned, we've got the two data warehouse style things. We've got provision SQL pools that used to be called SQL data warehouse. We've got SQL on demand or SQL serverless, different names, um, using for querying data in real time. And we've got our Spark engine. And then we've got a, a data lake. So when we provision signups, we have to say this is sitting in a lake. So any data signups has is held within that same lake. So unlike Databricks, which has its DBFS and that hides some data off in a storage account we can't really access, we see everything that Synapse is doing. It's got its own metadata store, again, similar to uh, Databricks, but it means we can save tables. We can say, actually, just take that folder structure with like thousands and thousands of Parquet files and just call it, you know, dbo.schools. And then I can do select star from schools and that's going to work, which is awesome. Again, it's abstract. It's making it easier for people to kind of use Spark without knowing they're using Spark. And then similar to Data Factory and a lot of the other Azure proponents, we have this kind of monitoring and management plane. It looks very much like Data Factory. So if you're used to these tools, again, you can just start using this and go, oh, okay, I kind of know how this is working. Yeah, it's over in management. I've got linked services. All of that kind of stuff is baked in. So a similar experience between the two. And the main thing I want to do, we're, we're talking about Spark pools, not going to worry about too much about the other stuff. But yeah, it's interesting. There's two different options which have different pros and cons. So how do we actually decide? We look at three different sections. Number one is power. So we're talking about that cluster, what's actually going to happen. So I alluded earlier that you've got this core open source project, this Apache Spa. And then there's a runtime around it that Databricks have built. There's a proprietary Databricks runtime. So you're not just using vanilla open source Spark, you're using Databricks Spark which comes with a load of optimizations, a load of extra stuff, a load of little hooks into some of their own features, which is cool. Generally means you're looking at quite fast things. Um, now, there's certain things that just by the nature of the fact they're doing that and by the nature of the fact that they are the ones who are he contributing so heavily to the open source project kind of means they're the first to get. It. So recently we've just had a load of extra stuff. So. One, we've got a load of functions to make life easier. Uh, my favorite one, the thing called bad records path. If you're reading some data and some other rows don't fit the schema that you're saying, you can reject those rows automatically and put them into a JSON file with a tag saying why they failed. And that's a Databricks function. So it's not an open source spot. And that makes life as an ETL developer, building a data engineering style data pi uh, pipeline so easy. And some of those like nice little things, they're all Databricks specific. We've got a lot of optimizations, and it tends to be Databricks get some really cool optimization stuff, make those ones open source, and then add some more that they keep for themselves. Uh, and a lot of those have gone into Spark 3. So Spark 3.0 came out a couple of months ago and has a ton of stuff that really make building complex data models really achievable. So if you've got, if you've got something like a Kimball star scheme, you've got facts and dimensions, and you're joining across the two, there's a load of optimizations that went into Spark 3 that are in the open source that allow you to filter a dimension, have that cross filter and do partition filtering, dynamically do data pruning, loads of cool stuff like that that just makes the whole experience for the analysts better. And traditional Spark didn't have that big a focus on the analyst. It was like, they've got a SQL platform, but it's very easy to write really poor performing code. And there's been a massive mind shift for Spark 3 to say, you know what, let's make this perform as good as a warehouse. That's their current uh, focus. So because Databricks had committed a lot of the code that was behind Spark 3, they were the first to adopt it. It's, it's already been in um, the Databricks runtime for MidSnet. And that's one of the benefits you get on the Databricks side. They're going to be quick. They're going to be just behind the actual core Spark releases because they're writing it so they can get there faster. However, there is the formation of a Synapse runtime. So the little of the Microsoft are putting in to kind of make that better and produce the argument a bit more, add a bit more oomph into the Synapse Spark pool. And we don't know too much about what that looks like yet. And that's going to be an interesting race. So obviously, Databricks have a head start. They've been doing this for years, what, well, since they invented Spark. And Synapse are just coming in. But Synapse have all of the power of the rest of the Microsoft product teams behind them. So it's going to be interesting to see how much of their jockeying for that position. So to kind of put it another way, we've got Databricks and Synapse. Databricks straight out there with Spark 3.0 and some optimizations of their own built on top of Spark 
Now, Synapse, I imagine, I do not know, but I'm assuming they're going to have Spark 3.0 fairly soon. They don't have it yet. So they're at least a couple of months behind Databricks adopting this new version of Spark. And I don't know if that's going to be a vision of things to come. Is that going to, are we going, constantly going to be on this like back foot going, oh, when are we getting here? There, we got it. And the interesting thing is, as I alluded to earlier, Databricks are about to bring out this new version of Spark. It's this thing called the Delta Engine and the Photon Query Engine coming. And there is a whole raft of things that's going to make Spark a hell of a lot more efficient and a hell of a lot faster, especially for that kind of analyst-style SQL query. And that's coming. And it'll be interesting to see if by the time Synapse adopt Spark 3.0, Databricks are then making that next leap. And so you're constantly going to see that kind of leapfrogging of Synapse trying to catch up. And that's the thing to watch over the next kind of six months, a year. How much is Synapse Spark going to be able to catch up? Now, currently, obviously they're behind, but they're still building the rest of the platform. They have to put in things like, just put in things like parameterization. So are they behind because they're currently filling out all the other things? And then as soon as that's done and they've got this steady platform and they're live, they can then really start focusing on making that engine fly. Or is this a story we're going to see? So Databricks is always going to be ahead, always going to be pushing the next generation, the next load of innovation. And so this kind of the fairly steady, has tortoise in the hair kind of thing. And that we don't currently know. And that's the biggest thing in terms of looking at the two, going, do you want to be on the, the cutting edge, the latest, with a slight price tag on it? Or are you okay being on the one that's fairly a little bit behind, but integrates with everything and it's focused on ease of use? It's, uh, I don't know. So in terms of how we're seeing things plug together, so I mentioned that it's based on Java earlier. So you've got this Spark cluster, I've got a driver, I've got my workers. They all work on a thing called the JVM, the Java Virtual Machine. So that means everything is running in Java. That's why it's always been a little bit weird when we're using things like Python and R, which they don't compile down to Java. So if you're using the actual data frame, the core Spark engine, that's fine. Because you're submitting Python and R to that engine, and that turns it into Java under the hood. But it's always been slightly painful if you're bringing in something extra and saying, I want to run my own Python library or a separate other R library I found somewhere. Because they don't compile down to Java, which means there's a performance hit. Because on that machine, it has to go outside the Java virtual machine, use the library, pull it back. And that, that operation, that interop, is normally very, very slow. So there's a whole thing around that, which is kind of keeping an eye on it to go, what's going to happen there? Inside there, you've got these things called executors. So each of my workers has an executor on it. And then depending on the number of CPUs I have on each executor, I get a number of slots. And this, is, this comes down to how you size your cluster, which is a big question between Databricks and Synapse because they've taken very different approaches. So I've been Databricks. This is what I'm looking at. I'm going, OK, so I've, I've got this amount of data. That breaks up into so many chunks of data. To process a chunk of data, I need a spare CPU. So if, I, if my data splits nicely up into 16 chunks of data, I can process it entirely on this cluster. So I've got 16 free um, slots. Makes sense. So Databricks all about thinking about how big should your driver be, how big should your individual workers be, and how many of them do you want? And then any work that you have just shares the cluster that you've given it. So you can have 10, 20, 100, 2,000 users all trying to use the same cluster, and they're just queuing up, waiting for slots to pick up free. Now, Synapse has taken a very different approach to it. Essentially, Synapse has taken the absolutely zero crossover between users approach. So Databricks is, I provision one thing, lots of people use it, and I kind of carve it up and use it most efficiently as I can between lots of queries. In Synapse, I provision a Spark pool, so a potential a, what's the maximum amount of CPU I want to use at any one time? In this case, similar thing I've said, I've got, I want four workers worth of data. And then once one runs a query, that makes a session. And that kind of just pencils and kind of earmarks so many of those CPUs and says, I'm going to run a session on these particular parts of my pool, and I'll run the work. And that'll keep a lock on those particular sessions, on those particular um, that's those slots, that hardware. Another session comes in, that just grabs the next load. If a third session comes in, currently that'll error. That'll go, well, you know, you don't have any spare CPUs. Your pool isn't big enough. And that's a very different way of working. So for me, I'm used to in the Databricks world of saying, just fire off all my jobs in parallel, and I know my Databricks cluster will just chunk through it. 
things will sit in the queue until some slots come free, then it'll start working on it and then it'll kick off and then it'll start the next one. It'll just work through all of that. In signups, I need to plan for what's the biggest amount of capacity I need at any one time. And that's kind of the slant they've made when actually sort of designing this so far. It's very designed for um, quite fixed jobs, not this dynamic scaling up a mess of doing things and dynamically determining how many jobs to run. It's very much geared towards the, I know what I'm going to run, I need to plan for that amount of running, and then kick it off. So, yeah, difference. Different ways of thinking about how you want to plan for this stuff. Okay, so special things they can do. Databricks has DB utils. It's a whole load of special functions built into those notebooks, allowing us to do things like install libraries on a one-off cluster or just on a notebook, to move files, rename files, change folders, to secrets, to credential management, store management, just baked into Databricks, which is cool. So I can pull key vaults and bring back a credential and then use that to connect somewhere. Widgets, I mentioned they're the drop-down parameters to allow you to connect to different things. So many cool things in there. Uh, we've got things like version control. So we can have it so we're working on a particular notebook and every change I make is kind of just getting synced and saved automatically. And then I can hit a button and commit that to my Git repo, or your dev, whatever it happens to be. So lots of really nice, as I said, quality of life uh, that is in data because it's fairly mature. Now, Synapse is less about that, as we we're saying. It's things like, one, it's got a native lake browser, which is just so useful. So if I'm in Databricks and I want to know, actually, could I just browse that lake? I need to open up a separate Azure portal or Azure Storage Explorer, go to my lake, have a look what's in there. It's not a massive hardship, but it's just so easy in Synapse to go, well, what's in my lake? Go and have a look, browse it, right click, say new script, and it'll generate a new notebook for me. So some of the, the kind of integrations Microsoft can do a lot better because again, this is all of their stack. And obviously links into the other parts of Synapse. So when we're talking about these bits, the kind of the data warehouse parts and data factory, then they just integrate and they're natively part of it. So saying in data factory, just run a Synapse job, run the next thing, call the store proc inside provision SQL pools, that's all just baked in. And this one is super interesting. So Cosmos DB, the essentially giant document database um, has this thing called Synapse Link. So now if we've got a Cosmos DB that holds all of our application data and we're just throwing thousands and thousands of single writes and we're just keeping that all our data up to date, we can kind of click a button and that will automatically take that data, write it down into its own little mini managed lake and make that instantly queryable from Synapse. So without having to do any ETL, without having to say, okay, so take our change feed coming from Cosmos, land that in a lake so I can query it, register that table. It's just registered, as you see in that picture there, kind of, we just see our linked Cosmos DB, we can see the elements underneath that, and we can start querying it. And one of the big things is that data store is held in Parquet, which is time store, and therefore incredibly, really effective, very, very good for doing analytical queries. So. If you're using things like Cosmos, the Synapse integration is awesome. Uh, I mean, there's a bit of like, they call them that HTAP, the hybrid transactional and analytical processing. Um, there's a load of marketing about you no longer needing a warehouse because this is doing it for you. You can do it directly on operational. That's crazy talk. However, it does mean you can skip a load of ETL steps and you can do operational reporting directly from it, which is really cool. So that's a massive, massive thing for Synapse in terms of that integration if you're on Cosmos DB. Okay, so in terms of storing data, so we both have this idea of a thing called Hive. So if I'm in Databricks and I've got my Parquet or I've got my Delta or I've got my various other things, I can say, well, take that directory structure, make it look like a SQL table so my SQL users can connect. You just get a list of databases and a list of tables and then just query it as if they were connecting to a SQL server. I mean, that's, that's just awesome anyway. Um, now in Synapse, I can do that. And I've got my Spark side and I can register things. But then that automatically copies over and makes the same metadata available to SQL On Demand. So if I'm in Synapse and using the SQL On Demand query engine, I can query all the tables that I've registered in Spark, which is awesome. So I can do a load of processing in Spark via some generic scripts that properly scales and all that kind of stuff register the tables at the end, and then my users just instantly see them in SQL On Demand and can start querying them. So that level of integration is really, really cool. Okay, bit about Spark.net. 
So yeah, I mentioned we can now do C sharp, and that's going through that same data frame API. So it's not like this other language that they've had to write their own optimizer for and jimmy it into the side. Because that is talking to the data frame API, it goes through the same query optimizer, it makes the same code, it is the same thing that gets run in the end as the rest of Spark. So that is really, really cool. Now UDFs, the kind of, if it's not a Spark job and I've got another library that came and I want to kind of build a manual user-defined function, that's the bit that, if you're doing Python or Argo slowly, and there are some optimizations, they have made that go quite quick for C Sharp. It's still not as fast as just doing straight Spark jobs. Weirdly, in Synapse, they've gotten rid of R. So they've got that in, but they've taken away R. So it would have been a massive win for Synapse if it was like, we do Python, Scala, R, and .NET. Instead, it's we've just swapped R for .NET. So that's what we're going to alienate a lot of the kind of academia, a lot of data science, a lot of people who love R that are all going to be that .NET y. Um, and it's kind of like showed a bit of an angle. For me, that shows that Synapse is really gearing for the, the kind of uh, application style jobs for the data processing. For they assume Spark is in this mix so we can prepare data, not so we can do ad hoc analytics, which is an odd choice for me. Okay, on the other side, back in, Del uh, in Databricks, we've got this thing, the Delta engine, and that is doing some crazy stuff. So I mentioned earlier that Spark's based on Java. That's why we've got those JVMs and all that kind of stuff. Now, Databricks have recently rewritten the entire Spark engine so that it executes on C++. So they can do all sorts of really interesting things about folding up the data before they send it to the CPU so they can be processing four or eight or more bits of data at once and getting that kind of factor of speed up. So when I was mentioning there's going to be like another shift in terms of Databricks performance, this is coming. And assuming, you know, in the next few months, we're going to see a massive speed up in terms of how Databricks is working, which is going to be, again, that jump ahead like Spark 3 currently is. So the Delta engine, all the kind of the Delta Lake functionality, plus this Photon engine doing that C++ query for me is all sorts of cool. However, signups are also doing some interesting stuff. So signups have come up with this thing called Hyperspace, which is kind of like a non-clustered index for Spark. So saying, we'll take our data, and currently, you know, if we want to try and read our data, there's no such thing as an index in Spark. So if you want to get a particular set of records, it has to read everything in and then filter it down in memory. Now, Hyperspace is saying, well, let's just take a copy of that, order it in a specific way that just has the data for certain columns in that data set, aka it's a covering non-clustered index, and then it's automatically kept up to date. And that's a weird, interesting idea, unlike anything we've currently got in Spark. So definitely interesting stuff. However, up in Databricks land, so we've got two different things that are really interesting on that same front. So for data scientists, we've got this thing called MLflow, and that is a whole data science experimentation tracking. So you can run lots of different jobs. You can see which of your models performed the best, what the different parameters were, what the different accuracy curves were. And you can go back to the one that performed the best. You can promote models. Loads of really, really cool stuff in there. However, Synapse has Azure ML. So it's got a lot of the same things, but in the baked in Azure version. So again, similar approaches, different ways of tackling it, but similar parity of uh, functionality. The difference is on this Delta Lake side. So Delta Lake is a, a file format. And it's a file format that Databricks have open sourced, which is taking Parquet and then putting some really cool stuff around the top. So you can have things like transactional consistency. You can have temporal queries. You can write merge statements. All of which, if you can make from a relational engine point of view, is like, yeah, it's, that's, that's what a database engine does. That's the point why this is so cool is because you never had any of that stuff in a data lake. And data lake was always seen as this kind of messy thing because you didn't have these nice rigid data model structure things on the top. Delta Lake gives you that. Now, Databricks have their own proprietary version of Delta Lake. So they open source this single Delta Lake. It's baked into Synapse automatically, but they have their own special version in Databricks, which is faster, it's optimized, it has special things. And one of those things is called Z ordering, which reorganizes the data and does some file compaction to make it faster to bring up certain data if you're querying on certain columns, aka a clustered index. So whereas kind of um, signups have gone the, the kind of non-clustered covering index route, Databricks have kind of gone there, we'll just reorganize your data as an asynchronous maintenance job. So 
both tackling similar problems. And in that one, Databricks is slightly ahead because the Z ordering is really cool. And it's just, it's changing your data. And the way they've implemented it within Delta is actually very, very good. But similar, there's lots of jockeying for positions, doing similar things and coming out with competing attacks. Finally, a bit on price. So Synapse, as I'm on the niche show, looking at the pure things, Synapse is cheaper. However, this is preview costing. So we don't know the actual final costs yet. And Databricks is, has a license fee. So we kind of assume that Databricks is a little bit more expensive, like for like, and this is assuming if we turn them both on for the same amount of time at the same scale, which isn't always gonna be the case. Now, the, what we've seen from Synapse currently is those sessions, when I've got my Spark pool and I have a session, that session stays on and it has a time to live. So I start using it, it maybe stays active for 10 minutes, 20 minutes, whatever it happens to be. During that time, we assume I'm being charged for that session being active and up. It can auto scale, but only the Spark pool. So the pool can change how many sessions it allows it at a time. But those sessions, which is just locked to a single usage, they don't scale natively. So that is okay. However, when we look at Databricks and we go, you know what, auto scaling in Databricks Premium is excellent. So we can actually just have it turned on and then say, look, make a really small cheap plus I'm not paying a lot of money for. As soon as users come, if I start piling up a load of things in my queue, just get bigger, just grow, expand a load of clusters, use it for a load of stuff. And then if we're in premium mode, the auto scale is really, really good. It'll sort of exponentially go, no one's using it? Okay, take down 50% of my clusters, another 50%, another 50%, and really quickly get down to the lower level. So it's gonna scale very, very quickly up and down, essentially, which means we get a tight coupling between how much we're paying for and how much we need to be paying for, and that's quite closely mapped in Databricks. Whereas what we currently see in Synapse is it's quite chunky. It's a one user, one usage, that session stays alive, and it, it doesn't actually scale across a high concurrency um, approach. But then it's in preview. They've not, they've not actually released how that's gonna work yet. So currently, if you're trying to compare costs, on the face of having the two things turned on together, Databricks is more expensive. In terms of actual usage, Databricks will be way cheaper if you're not actually consistently using it and you have peaks and troughs of usage, as almost all of us do, Databricks will end up cheaper because it can scale that more effectively. By the time that Synapse goes live and we get GA, is that still gonna be the case? Are they gonna have implemented a lot more kind of session sharing and auto scaling and that kind of stuff? We don't know. So that is an unknown currently. As, we, or as what we know currently, what we can currently see, Databricks will be cheaper in certain circumstances because of the auto scale feature, but we just don't know. So yeah, it's an interesting thing. There's a lot going on between these two different ones. And you know it's hard to kind of visualize because we've not done a tech demo, we've not dived into, hey, this is what the two of them look like. But honestly, they look very similar. They're both using notebooks. They both have same similar languages. There's slight different bits of syntax as to one that you use. The main question is, which one do you use based on all those features, based on what the problems you're trying to solve? Now, it might have been evident across there, there is, there's definitely a bias with terms of what we're talking about. As a heavy Spark user myself, the winner is fairly obvious. It's very, very much Databricks is a more premium, more robust, more mature Spark offering currently. However, Synapse is in preview. So yeah, sure, comparing something that's been out for a few years, and a ton of investment, currently in the middle of upgrading and optimizing, to something that is a brand new feature that hasn't even gone live yet, is an unfair comparison. And we're seeing them a lot at the moment. We're being forced to make that comparison a hell of a lot, and it's not a fair comparison currently. If you're looking to start working with Spark right now, Databricks is a no-brainer, because it is out, it is mature, it's got a lot of stuff that's in and works already. You cannot use sign up Spark in production because it is in preview. That's not to say in six months, that answer is going to be as clear cut. Definitely not to say in 12 months, two years, definitely not going to be that clear cut. But it's definitely an interesting thing to be thinking about with all the marketing going on, all the hype and all that kind of stuff. Taking a step back and going, which one should I use right now? It's definitely Databricks. Which one should we be using? Let's assume Synapse goes live with all these features and they fix some bugs, it's all out there and happy. So then we're interested in seeing which is the one we should be using. And the way we're trying to talk about it is this kind of idea of your enterprise versus standard edition. 
Databricks on the face value, ignoring auto scaling, is slightly more expensive because it has this Databricks license. You're paying for a premium cost because it's got a lot of premium features, a load of extra stuff, a load of optimizations, a load of things they're baking into it. Where Synapse is a currently slightly less functionality, much more vanilla runtime, some fuel optimizations. It's a little bit less fully featured because again, it's a preview. But we're kind of expecting this is what it's going to look like in six months, 12 months time anyway. Databricks aren't going to stop ramping and focusing and turning the entire engine of a whole company to make that a better product. As opposed to on the Microsoft side, where it is just one of the products that's among many, 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 many things. So we're kind of going to, this is how we're putting it. If you're doing lots of Spark, Databricks is a no-brainer. If you're doing a little bit of Spark and you want integration and baking it in and having a common platform, that's a much less clear-cut argument. So straightforward. I'm trying to say I'm building a platform that's largely based in SQL. I've got an existing SQL data warehouse that I want to have inside here and just put it in straight in. I want to use SQL on demand. I want to use data factor. I want to have all these things baked in. There's one or two Spark use cases that I might want to use. In that case, Synapse is probably easier. There's less integration work. There's less thinking about the cluster and the design and stuff. If you're just doing the occasional odd notebook as part of a much bigger picture, then it probably makes sense to go with Synapse and bake that in. Because you, you're not going, you don't need the full sledgehammer that is Databricks. You can just do a little bit of Spark to augment your current processes. If you're going for a big, heavy data engineering, you're building a lake house, you're trying to do a very, very Spark-based project, that's a no-brainer for us currently that Databricks is going to give you a premium experience. You're going to have a better time. It's got more features. It's got more functionality. It goes faster. So all of these things just mean Databricks is the assumption for if it's if that kind of skew of how much Spark are you expecting in a data platform. If you're expecting lots and lots of Spark, it's Databricks. If it's a tiny bit of Spark, probably signups. Somewhere in the middle, it depends on integrations and depends on your users. It depends on if C-sharp is an important thing to you, if R is an important thing to you. So there's very much a, it depends, but hopefully I'm equipping you with the, the options you need to work through to make that decision. Now, actually, what most people are thinking about heading to is this combined platform. You know, there was a tagline of, you know, better together of saying, well, actually, doing some of the processing and prep work in Databricks because it is a more premium Spark engine and then baking it into the other elements of Synapse. Now, because Synapse can sit on an existing lake and Databricks can just map that lake, they can share a common ecosystem without a lot of integration work. It's really easy to have this whole thing working as a single platform. And that's kind of our default answer. So it's not, is it Synapse or is it Databricks? It's, it's bits of both, depending on what you need. If it's, is it Spark pools or is it Databricks? Then it comes down to how much premium content you need, how optimized you need it. How important is it that you're on the cutting edge of optimizations and new features versus having something that's really simple to integrate with some other stuff. And that's gonna be the interesting point to keep an eye on over the next few months. So that is all I want to go through. So thanks very much for listening. And I hope that has given you some food for thought. I hope it's made you think, maybe it's not as clear cut as we thought it was. And hopefully there's a bit of excitement about how many things are coming in the near future. So over the next three months, six months, 12 months, we're gonna see a whole load of new features in both sides. So both on the Databricks side and on the um, Synapse Analytics side, it's gonna be a real interesting space to watch regardless. So again, I'm around answering questions, so feel free to grill me about anything that we know about Azure Synapse Analytics, about Databricks, about the Delta Engine and Photon and all that crazy stuff. And don't forget to drop by our booth in Advanced Analytics and come say hi, come ask us any questions and enjoy the rest of SQL Bits. Cheers.